Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Audrey Kruger, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the uh, Center for the Study of Cooperatives to our uh, seminar for March. And we're pleased to have Michael Zellner here from Fair Trade Canada. And um, we're also pleased to be a part of a really cooperative effort for this presentation. So I'd like to acknowledge um, that. Um, if anybody got a look at our poster, that they saw that there's a number of uh, you know, fellow sponsors on this. So um, first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Saskatchewan Council for International Cooperation. Um, they provided the, uh, the bulk of funding to bring Michael here from Ottawa. And we have Denise McDonald here, give a wave. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and she was really helpful in us putting together <laughs> our proposal. Um, but that leads me to Oxfam Canada and Danielle Pardal. And she actually was um, great in herding the cats and getting us to come together. And she actually did the bulk of the work around the application. So thank you for that. Um, other notables are Engineers Without Borders. Um, they're not here, but um, Michael will tell you how he met with them earlier today and had a very successful and interesting meeting with uh, the USSU and um, the University of Saskatchewan food purchasing people, mm -hmm. the very important people that make decisions. Indeed. Um, as well, we have uh, Daryl McLaughlin from STM, and he met earlier with Michael. Um, also, the Canadian Cooperative Association and the Refinery were uh, partners in this initiative, in this tour. So this is the third speaking tour, uh, third, third event, speaking yeah. event that mm -hmm. you've done in this tour. So um, I've, you know, I've been. This, this will be the third one that I've. Attended, I'm so sorry. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was gonna. I was gonna say that you know you're as inspiring as you are entertaining. So, well, thank you. Um, with that, there's no pressure. No. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about Michael. As I said, he comes from Fair Trade Canada, and he's the media communications director there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a national organization that deals with um, certification and labeling of fair trade products in Canada. Um, and before that, Michael and I have a connection actually through Oxfam Canada. Mm -hmm. He was regional chair and also instrumental in um, advocating and eventually. Um, securing a uh, fair trade purchasing policy for the city of Vancouver, which is, has huge um, impact because that city buys a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and he comes to us today to present on his research that he did while getting his MA. And that MA is in Resource Management and Environmental Studies at UBC. And he was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time in Nicaragua um, researching organic, how organic coffee markets can support ecosystems in Nicaragua. So, with that, I'll uh, hand it off to you. And thank, thank you. Very much. All right. So, some of you I've seen before. You all know about fair trade, so presumably, yes. Anyone new to fair trade? No idea? Okay, good. So, we're in good shape for this. I'll give you a bit of context for this. this is when I, the idea to do this research in the first place, I'd spent a little bit of time in Nicaragua, coffee, fair trade coffee, you know, stuff, doesn't matter what. Um, and, uh, and I was coming back and I was talking to a lot of people in Canada and you know, I was asking them about things like fair trade, were they aware of it? This was, this was before fair trade was any grocery stores, it was very small and that isn't even at the beginning of fair trade. Um, but I was speaking to people and they'd say, oh yeah, fair trade, organic, I, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I believe that, but they thought it was the same thing and they were conflating the two. And then I was noticing, of course, that um, a lot of fair trade advocates were saying that, well, fair trade is the, is the gold standard for environment. And I thought, well, I haven't read any research on this. And even when it came to organics and organic coffee, I hadn't seen a lot. It was really talking about how is it that these, these certification systems that exist, how is it they, they actually lead to environmental impact? What is the mechanism? How would it work? Does it do anything? Um, I presume that it did. They were both, you know, they were reputable systems, but I didn't really understand how it worked, and I didn't really know what specifically it did. So it kind of launched this idea of, you know, really, how do the fair trade and organic markets affect forested ecosystems? Um, spoiler alert, uh, cooperatives, um, by the way, is, is really the big thing there. Um, and specifically what I'm talking about, has anyone heard of bird friendly before, shade grown, this kind of stuff? Okay, so this concept of shade grown really came out of some work that was from the Migratory Bird Institute at the Smithsonian Institute, uh, uh, Smithsonian Institute it's Migratory Bird Center, yeah. And uh, it was really just pointing out that there'd been a lot of deforestation throughout Latin America and it continued. Um, and that uh, what, what ended up, where birds ended up going essentially as these forests were destroyed was they were going to coffee farms. So, um, so look at me, look at the screen. That's coffee farm, okay? So this is basically what we're talking about. It's, it's a, a very complex in, uh, ecosystem, you've got 
multiple products in there. It's essentially indistinguishable from a regular forest. I mean, you, can, you might be able to tell, you might be act actually be able to see that there's coffee in here and other types of products. But it creates a lot of habitat for animals. It's a really important bastion for biodiversity. It's a really important place for migratory birds. It's an important place for habitats. But there's another kind of way, there's another approach to farming coffee. And it's something that evolved in the 70s, actually, is when it started out. So that's this. Right? Something more typical, sort of when people think about farming, they see something that's more along these lines. And these monocultures really came about from um, a, a concern about a, a fungus that was going through coffee. It was a coffee leaf rust that really affected the productivity. And so people developed a, a way to, to farm it. And they were cutting out the trees. And they were making it so it was grown under the full, uh, under the full sun. And a lot of agrochemicals went into it for a variety of reasons. And in fact, what you can see here, um, is a, a lot of capital. So you can see a big tractor there. This is actually a machine that's, uh, that harvests coffee it's by kind of shaking it. You, you end up getting really poor quality coffee. Um, whereas this, this, this system here is exclusively in the domain of small scale farmers. And this was already well documented before, uh, before I did my research. So I had a question about this because this is essentially what prices were doing at the time. So when I, was, when I was doing my research, when I was looking at doing my research, we were in a period called the coffee crisis, where the pr prices for coffee, world prices for coffee, were at the lowest point that they'd been in 100 years, um, once you adjust for inflation. This is essentially where they sat. And so we knew that it, you know, it, was already, it was already well documented that there was dislocation. A lot of people, had, some people had lost their farms. There were certainly a lot of workers that weren't, um, that weren't actually picking coffee anymore. They had no employment. It was having huge impact on communities. So, the question that I essentially had was, what is it that, what would this market do to the ecosystems that were there? If we have about 50% of coffee at the time grown in the, in the, 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 the large farm monocultures and about 50% grown on the shade, but about 90 some percent of the farmers, because they're small, uh, were, were in that shaded situation, what would happen? Would this kind of uh, market context, would this drive the good practices out of business and leave us with the, the monocultures? And the way that this would happen was what I was concerned about, because I'd been in Nicaragua before. I, th I, knew this, I knew the region in particular, and I knew the different industries that were there. So if it wasn't a coffee farm, you would get beans, for instance, is what I was thinking. This was my thought. Or something not as good would be corn. So beans at least are leguminous, and you can build your soil. But you could get corn. Or the other big thing that I knew that was popular in the region, cattle. And of course, I was really worried about all these things because you think, okay, you've got these nice, beautiful, forested agro ecosystems, and now you lose it completely. You lose all the biodiversity, you lose all the habitats, um, and is this going to be a problem? So I came up with a few research questions, four of them actually. So the first one, right off the bat, is to what extent do the price premiums help farmers to, uh, to produce coffee in these forested ecosystems? So with fair trade and with organics, and I'll get into it a little bit later, but they have various price incentives there. They have various ways to reward a behavior. And so I knew that in the case of fair trade, it could only come from co-ops of small-scale farmers. And in the case of organics, um, you know, they were going through co-ops uh, if, if they were going to access the small-scale farmers that were managing these, these complex ecosystems. So to what extent would these price premiums, given that the market was very poor, to what extent would they keep the farmers in business? You know, prevent them from going out of business and, and, or turning their, their, uh, their farms into the other types that I just showed. And then the next one was to what extent do the environmental standards associated with the two affect the way that farmers manage their land? So farmers are doing their thing. Each certification system has environmental standards. And then do these actually impact anything? How do they actually do it? I was also savvy enough at this point, because I'd been there, and I knew that co-ops played a really key point, but I, a key part in this, but I didn't know what, the, what it was. And so I wanted to know what was the significance of the cooperatives as intermediaries. So as I said before, fair trade will only, at least in coffee, will only work with co-ops or co-op-like organizations of small-scale farmers. So there's no other way for fair trade to actually access those small-scale farms and impact on them without going through the co-ops. And in the case of the organics, there's no way that a small-scale farmer would be able to access the organic market without being involved in a co-op as well. So what was, you know, essentially as playing as intermediaries, what did that role look like and how was it significant? And then the fourth thing is, how were the coffee cooperatives significant or important to their members and to the ecosystems they manage? And this was more thinking beyond the standards of the certification system. So I took those research questions and I brought them here. So the, this is Nicaragua and these are five I think there are still just five uh, states where you have coffee being produced. 
and I took it specifically to the state of Madagalpa, and in two places, one Pankasan, which is a community that I'd been to uh, for a few months before, um, and uh, El Coyolar, where it, there was another uh, primary co-op um, located that was a member of a tertiary co-op, so, or a third tier co-op, uh, that was in the city of Madagalpa there. And these were my methods. Now, please keep in mind, master's, <laughs> master's research, there are always limitations, this sort of thing. But I was dealing with two primary co-ops, so in Pankasan and in Ocoyular. One was called La Esperanza, that was in Ocoyular, and that was my fair trade co-op. And then I had uh, Aquapan, uh, which was the organic co-op, and that was located in Pankasan. There were two local support NGOs that were working with uh, the farmers, uh, we, and I did 25 in-depth guided farmer interviews that ran from 30, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on the farmer. It was guided in the sense that I had some prompts. I said, okay, what about this? But I more or less just let the farmers run with it, and I wanted to uh, extract certain ideas and see where they were thinking, but really where their, where their own interests were located. Then I had six open-ended expert interviews with different people in the NGOs and also within the tertiary co-op, co-op managers, this sort of thing, and just let them run with it. I explained what it was that I was doing, and I just picked up what they thought. A few prompts, I, bringing in information that I'd picked up in my... Uh, work with the farmers and just, just bounce ideas off of them and to see what sort of things resonated. I had production records for approximately 100 farms, and I went to 30 tours guided by farmers. Um, they were, you know, after I do an interview, the interview would more or less continue because I would just go on their farm and I'd have them show me different, um, different features of the farms and, and this sort of thing, and, and we'd continue the conversations. And then, of course, three bee stings, six ticks, and dozens of ant bites, which I can assure you, because I've checked, is not mentioned anywhere in the handbook of qualitative methods. Um, <laughs> I'm not a quantitative guy, and there are numbers there, so if anyone has a quantitative background, just so you know, I had that in my method, methodological toolkit also. The bee stings, by the way, killer bees. And, okay, I just thought they were like really mean bees. You swell up, baby, that's, uh, that's crazy town, and they chase you. I ran and ran. Don't do it. So let's have a closer look at these farms, and we should probably get to it, and I'm conscious of time, so I'll just move it along pretty quickly. So again, this is, these are the farm, this is the, this is the farm that I presented to you as a small-scale farm. But in fact, there's quite a range of farming that occurs. So um, in 1999, a couple of researchers, Mogul and Toledo, uh, came up with uh, this range of things. So we had rustic, and rustic farming was basically great. We've got a, a forest that's in place, We'll clear out a little bit of the underbrush, we'll plant some coffee in there, and for the most part, we'll just leave the ecosystem intact, pick some coffee, fairly low impact. Then we have traditional polyculture, which is we'll take out some of the tree species, we'll plant in some other types of food crops, different kinds of things, and they'll have various uses to them, but still it's largely an original forest, and then you have this. Commercial polyculture takes that a bit further, and it largely replaces all the native vegetation, but there will still be trees, and there'll still be all sorts of things in there, but they're usually, usually products that are for a particular use, that are serving a particular purpose. Then you have shaded monoculture, which is very similar to the farm that I showed you, except it has a few trees here and there. They might be trees that are leguminous. If I say leguminous, do people understand what I'm talking about? It's just basically um, nitrogen in soils is often a limiting factor for growth, and so it's why people put a lot of nitrogen fertilizers there. Is you put it in, increases the, the nitrogen in the soil, things grow. And there are some plants that can take and put nitrogen into the soil, and it's a, let's call it a natural fertilizer, and it does it through different, different processes. Leguminous. Leguminous. So they have nitrogen-fixing bacteria in their root system, is my understanding. Although I'm not an agronomist, but that's my understanding of it. Beans, also, as an example. So there, there's different ways that people get nitrogen into their soils, but this is one way that it's done. And then unshaded mo monoculture, which is the one that I showed you, where it's just packed in trees, they produce lots and lots of coffee, um, and that's about it. But they're re very reliant on, um, uh, on agrochemicals. Now, what's interesting, and something that Mogul and Toledo didn't pick up, because in their system, it's to what extent is it the forest, and then it removes and eventually transitions into something else. Well, something I picked up, which nobody had picked up before, as far as I know, is that this is a commercial, po is commercial polyculture. Because bef about 25 years before this, there was nothing. It was, coffee was used as a tool to actually reforest the region, and I saw this in many different places. It's not just a, to what extent can we grow coffee and not impact the forest, but it could actually be used as, a, as an economic engine to create a much more advanced ecosystem that was there before. It used to be all cattle grazing, corn, this sort of thing was in this region. But I don't want you to think that that's what they all look like, because that's another one. Much more sun, and that's also commercial polyculture. In fairness to this farmer, this is only three years old. 
And I have other photos that are very small, and I saw a number of fallow areas that were being turned into coffee. And you look at it and you say, well, there's no trees there. But in fact, there were thousands of trees that were about this tall that they planted, and it was in their first year, and they were using this as a reforestation method. So why are these farms important? Well, multi-strata veg vegetation. So uh, there's a huge amount of structural complexity in these things that go right from the roots, which is really important for soil retention. Um, and it goes all the way up. You can have multiple food crops in place. You can have use, different use crops. You have different things to, uh, to um, create income. You have uh, shade as well, which leads to better, um, uh, more availability of water because your, your climate is not as dry as a result because of the shade. Um, you have better soil retention and building through the leguminous trees that I mentioned. You also have leaf litter coming down and creating fer and essentially fertilizing and building up the, building up the, uh, the soils as well. Um, and you have better habitats, both because there's lots more places for, uh, for, for the animals and the, and the insects to live, but also because there were far less chemicals going in there and usually pesticides kill pests and animals of various kinds. In terms of the tree species, so uh, I think it was also the Mogel and Polito um, um, study had that there were about 13 to 58 different tree species in a single coffee farm, and this is what they detected. Um, in terms of tree density is what I picked up, at least in Aquapan, an average of 220 trees per hectare on top of the coffee, on top of everything else, so it was quite dense. You have 82 to 184 bird species in Mexico in traditional polyculture versus six to 12 in unshaded. And what was interesting is that proximity to ver uh, sort of natural forests increases the amount of, of, of bird species, but actually there tend to be more bird species in the coffee farms because they can attract both forest dwelling ones and ones that are looking for farms um, for food populations. Um, you have large populations of seed dispersing and in insectivorous mammals, which is fantastic uh, for the idea of spreading out different things, uh, growing your farm, cross-pollinization, pest management, these things are very important, and it, rely, it reduces the need for pe uh, pesticides. And you had large and diverse populations of arthropods, and again, this gets into the idea of insectivore species like hornets, which are really key for managing um, a very tricky pest called the um, coffee borer beetle. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. I could have shown a picture, but it doesn't much matter. It gets in a lot of coffee. It doesn't get here, by the way, so don't worry. Keep drinking your coffee. <laughs> Keep drinking your fair trade coffee, please, actually. Um, and the reason why, why they do this really comes down to farm economics. It's a bit different. One of the thoughts that I had before was that if you have high prices for, for, farm, or for farmers through fair trade or whatever else, that they're just going to grow and grow and grow, and they're just going to start overproducing coffee. You know, basic economics background, this is what tells me it's going to happen. But in fact, they have scarce land, right? They don't have the ability to grow out like this. And the reason why you get that density in there is because they aren't able to grow out their land to a, to a large extent, and they have cheap labor, their own. And so what they do is they try to get as much possible uh, benefit out of their farms as they possibly can. And they're also not in it for the short term because these are generational farms. If they have the knowledge to do it, they'll want to make it as fertile and productive as possible. It won't necessarily be all coffee though because they have other interests beyond growing coffee. In the case of small scale farmers, coffee is a livelihood strategy. It's a way of getting cash way of having an income, but they have other interests. If you look at a larger farm, like the one I showed before, th the purpose of that is much more like a factory logic. It says, this thing exists, this entity exists to grow coffee, so the more coffee, the better, and we'll just push it out. But farmers use it as just one thing that they bring in. And so that's why they're very, food security is an obvious one. They want to eat food and they live there. They want to make sure that their water is healthy on farm and this sort of thing, that they're not exposed to agrochemicals as much as possible. Um, income diversification is very important as well. So in the case of, Cows, for instance, and milk production. You've got coffee being harvested at a single point in the year. You have milk producing throughout the year. You've got corn that comes at a different time. You've got uh, beans that grow throughout the year. And these things are important both from different revenue streams, ones that aren't vulnerable to the same season, availability of labor, because if you're working on your coffee, you're not going to be able to do other things. And just timing that properly is really key. And so they try to diversify as much as possible. And then it gets into ecosystem management, right? So this is, comes into the idea of soil building and, and having that multiple sort of multi-strata farming approach. And also I found out to my, very much to my surprise is that cows weren't so bad. I was thinking, of, I was grown up, on, or I grew up on these stories of cattle ranches are taking out the Brazilian rainforest and all sorts of things. And yes, probably true. But a few cows into these ecosystems were actually very healthy to deal with waste products that were naturally occurring through their, say, taking the pulp off of a coffee bean as an example or actually um, 
uh, and, and creating manure that could be used for, uh, for fertilizing and, and this sort of thing as well. And also this, the, uh, the milk that they could drink and they could also sell it and it was a new, um, it, was a, it was a good uh, source of income for them. And so also coffee quality. Now I put this in brackets only to say that coffee quality is usually enhanced by growing in the more shaded ecosystem than that other monoculture that I showed you before. Part of the reason, there's lots of different reasons for it. One of them though is coffee, on a coffee tree you pick the ones that are ripe and you have to come back multiple times usually to get the best quality. If you're just shaking that tree, you're getting it all and your quality it suffers as a result. Um, and when you manage it, you manage your land well and you have the processes in place, you can, you can create good quality coffee that can get a better price. Um, not all farmers know this though, so it's not the reason necessarily why you get that. But in terms of the crops that were there, I found about 50 different species of, of, of uh, or 50 different types of plants and animals, um, and I only have ones that were use, useful ones, like not just ones that were sitting there, but ones that were deliberately in place to bring some sort of food ser or service or income or something like that. And these were on, when I say you know, crops within the coffee plot, pretty straightforward. Crops, crops in other parts of the farm, so essentially the farmers would plant some of their land, if they had enough land, some of it would be in coffee and lots of other products, and then they would have it, uh, they'd have other types of things, they'd have other parts where they're growing corn only, and that sort of thing as well. So the mechanics of fair trade certification. So it's a, it's a voluntary system, right? It involves uh, independent auditing, uh, we make sure that pro us and the, the people that we're, that we're connected to uh, make sure that producers are meeting standards and everybody along the supply chain uh, meets those standards. Um, it's special and unique in the way that the entire supply chain is really controlled by the same organization or network of organizations. Um, it's, and, and I'll show you the difference in, in, um, in organic in a moment. Um, it really focuses on the relations of production. It has an explicit direction towards dealing with poverty. Um, and I, I hesitated to use the word empowerment, but really a big part of it is pushing things to co-ops as an example and allowing them to self-direct their own development, making sure that they get the resources that they need or trying to get them closer to the resources that they need to do the things that they know that have to happen. The specific uh, environmental criteria at the time were simply pro prohibitions on specific agrochemicals, ones that were banned in by the World Health Organization, Pesticide Action Network, these sorts of things, ones that were really particularly notorious, DDT would be a sort of classic one, um, and you couldn't cut the original forest down. And there was something called integrated crop management, which was a very loosey-goosey sort of thing, saying move towards uh, more environmental standards, but um, you know, it's kind of self-directed, it really wasn't that clear. It's since improved, actually, it's, it's fairly advanced now, and the way that, they, the way that it's done is very much on a people-centered thing. It's, it looks at where are things now and how can they improve, and it requires planning and continual improvement within the fair trade system on the environment. And then there are price floors and incentives. Here's the integrated supply chain that I was talking about. Essentially, ooh, I've got one of these now. So you've got a supply chain that just runs along here, and then you've got between the certification company owned by this group, which I'll explain in a second, and us, we check all of these actors from the producer all the way to the people who put it in the final packaging to make sure that they're meeting the standards. And then there's sharing of information between us and FlowCert. We also do other things that are not certification related, and we're a member of Fairtrade International, where standard setting occurs and there's producer support and global governance of the system, including setting those standards. And that's something where we are involved in a voting member and so are producers. There's a huge amount of producer involvement at that level. Uh, these are the certification marks that you'll see on products that are done under our system. That's the old one, moving to the new one that everybody but us used uh, up until recently. So, and then this is where the price floor comes in. So, if we go before when I said that there was the prices were the lowest point that they've been in 30 years, this is where they were. At the, or sorry, it says 30 years here, but that's not adjusting for inflation. So 100 years, it was down about here. So what happens in fair trade is we've got something called a minimum price. And whenever the market drops below what, we, what we've determined is the, the cost of sustainable production, then that means that you, you trigger the fair trade minimum price. And so the, price, the market price is down here. If anybody wants to buy any type of fair trade coffee, whatever quality, lowest possible quality, they can never pay less than this floor price. When the market goes up, as it often does, and it's actually up here right now, uh, no it's not, it's about there, um, then, the, then the fair trade price goes along with it. Um, there are other things as well. In the case of organics, it's a voluntary product certification, same thing, it's independent, same thing, but it focus on, focuses on individual operators, so you don't have that same supply chain thing, it just says, 
are the production processes, because that's what it focuses on, is the, is the process of production, are they following the standards at this level? Great, and then the certification goes to the next one. And any other certification body that could be completely unaffiliated, they end up checking the next operator, and then there's just a record that follows that product that says these various certifiers actually um, had looked at the product. Um, but it's not integrated in quite the same way. There's a huge focus on environmentally sustainable farming. There's prohibitions on all agrochemicals, not just some, GMOs, Ours has GMOs as well, and no cutting of original forest. There are also very strict controls on soil, waste, buffers, watershed management. These things are huge um, and largely ignored. When people think of organic, they just think of chemicals, but it's far more involved than that. Um, and unlike the fair trade certification system, which has that price floor in place, there are uh, market -based, it's a market-based pricing mechanism. So if, it, if the market deems that people want to buy organic coffee, if buyers want to, want to buy it from someone, then <coughs> It's based entirely on supply and demand. So, so a lot of farmers are moving out of organic certification in coffee precisely because it's not worth the, the effort that goes into it. Sometimes they're in, sometimes they're out, but there, there has been some trouble lately uh, for organics. Um, I should say as well that in the, another price incentive that I didn't mention that, that's in place for fair trade is that there's an additional premium um, that's required if the product is sold as organic as well. So this is something that organic doesn't even do. They've, they're strictly based on supply and demand and market. But if a coffee is fair trade certified and it's sold as organic certified at the same time, our system requires that there's an extra payment on top of that, an extra premium. At the time, I think it was 15 cents. It's now 30 um, above, the, above the price. So this is where cooperatives come in. I mean, they were crucial. Uh, for implementing the, the, the internal monitoring of the standards on the small farm. So um, in both organics and in fair trade, you essentially have uh, m members of the co-ops who are responsible for checking to make sure that the farmers are in place and the, that the standards are in place and, and being followed by the members. And the reason for that is that um, uh, is because it's a group certification. So if you've got one member that's not doing what they're supposed to do, an audit comes along, it could decertify the whole thing. So there's a, there's a reason to have that infrastructure in place. Um, it's a requirement for fair trade certification, as I mentioned before. Coffee, sh cocoa, sugar, cotton, herbs, spices, a pilot project on timber, gold, uh, all sorts of things can only come from co-ops or co-op-like structures of small-scale producers uh, in the fair trade system. Um, and they represent 68% uh, of bananas as well and 47% of tea, I believe. Um, they're efficient vehicles for information and technology dissemination. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they're very key for that in the sense that um, if we were just trying to, first of all, it would be logistically impossible for a certification system to deal with small scale farmers on a case by case basis. It would be completely unaffordable. Nobody could afford to do it. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a very efficient way uh, to do it. But in addition to that, co-ops are so, uh, as an institutionalized social network, I guess is one way that we could look at it, they're able to transfer knowledge to each other. They're, they facilitate member-to-member uh, -member communication. They also have internal programs um, that, are, that are key for just spreading out information and technology. And then, of course, they reduce costs and risk, uh, both for the members and for the people who buy from them, actually. And here's an example of, of some of the things that co-ops do. I mean, I mentioned before this idea that co-ops are involved beyond the certification standards. They're not simply there to enforce the standards of certification, and rather, they're there to meet the, the, the needs of their members. Certification systems, fair trade, organic, or whatever else, they are a strategy that the co-ops use on behalf of their members, and it's a one to provide extra income and this sort of thing. Um, and so their interest in fair tradey type things aren't just limited to what certifiers tell them. And here's an example of a field school, right? Now this, full disclosure, this is not actually coffee. That's sugarcane in the background, and it's not in Nicaragua either. But I didn't have a good picture of a, of a, of a field school here with me uh, when I put together the presentation. So, but yeah, you get the gist. And that's how that works. And it's really key. And I saw this as well. Every time I went on a, when I was going to different farms, both co-ops actually, they, they pointed out that I was getting a better sense of the different members' farms. I was seeing this, and then when they were, if they ever accompanied me, then they were doing a lot of, t they, they spoke to each other quite a bit about problems that they were having on farms and how they were dealing with it. And you know, there was, I also saw a really innovative she seed sharing thing that sort of grew up within the co-ops. And a lot of this was coming through the centralized agronomy programs, and sometimes it was just through the nature of, being, uh, of cooperating together. This, anyone know what this is? Worm culture, vermiculture, lombricultura, whatever you want to call it. This is huge. And they give you, and just as, a, as an example of how technology transfers through, this is, cr this is hugely important for the, the growing of, of well, in, in coffee, it was used for a lot of things. There was, they were distilling an organic 
as a fluid underneath it that they could use to deal with that coffee leaf rust that I was talking about before, but also creating good soils that they use for planting and this sort of thing. These worms, I believe, came from Honduras, originally from California. It was one co-op in a place, I don't know where, they, somewhere in, in Matagalpa. They went to Honduras on a trip. They got some of these worms. Well, worms grow and they spread. And when I first was there, so I, I went to Nicaragua over a, series, uh, several, over, over a number of years, various times. And it started out in just a couple places. And by the time I went back on my final trip, these worms had spread everywhere. And what was happening essentially is the worms would just grow and grow and grow. And then the farmers were breaking them off or whatever. They'd give some to other members. And then those ones would grow and they'd split. And they were spreading out to their different members and kept in little, little pen type things. And they were really useful for agriculture. And they spread within a co-op. And then they spread within a co-op network. And then eventually they spread from co-op to co-op. And then so the original co-op that had done this these worms or their descendants basically were in all sorts of places and they spread in a very nice and efficient way. It had huge implications actually for, um, uh, for farming and it was only made possible through the extensive networks that were there because of Nicaraguan cooperatives. What do they do? They take care of the soil? Yeah. yeah. Well, they, 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 they don't put their waste products in there, this sort of thing, and it becomes a really nutrient rich thing that they add into their um, in a compost kind of thing. Okay, they, so they're kept in a particular place and not just throughout the coffee farm. Okay. These are red wigglers. They're, they're yeah, very useful for yeah. breaking down, for example, coffee processing waste. So that's they're it. very difficult to break down and they that's can it. turn it into a very high quality organic fruit. That's it, exactly. And this is another thing that was innovative. It was a new project that I saw starting up. Um, and it was, it was an initiative by an NGO, but it was starting to spread through co-op. What this is is a biogas plant, essentially. So. Some of the farmers had cows, they put the manure in here, creates methane instead of being released into the, into the air. Um, it was released into this little pen. This is deflated right now because it was a new one. And it would grow up. And essentially what they were doing was they were piping. I don't know if I've got the thing in here. It, there's a, a little pipe that basically went into the house and it created a little cook stove as a result. And one thing that's really nice about that, although I have to admit, most women preferred the, that I spoke to preferred the, the normal stove, it at least allowed the possibility where you don't, have you ever heard the expression, keep the home fires burning? You know what that is? Yeah, you have to keep your, if, you're, if your whole house and your, or your home and your cooking and everything is based off of an oven that's running on, 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 uh, on wood, if you let that burn out, it's going to take a long time to get that going again and to be able to cook and to be able to all sorts, do all sorts of things. And the potential for this freeing up uh, work for women and also the fact that there wasn't a lot of uh, smoke, there's no smoke that came off of it, and turn a waste product into something that would be useful had a lot of potential. I don't know where it went. I, I saw some things. Some people had it. Again, most people who had it said, yeah, we think it's really great. And then they would just use their regular oven. But it was interesting. And it was starting to spread through the co-ops. No smell. No. Because it gets... Mm -mm. Because what happens, it goes in, and then it's going underneath, and then all of it was kind of raising up in the, in the thing, and then it gets burned. Yeah, it was pretty nice, actually. Um, pretty good stuff. So anyways, I'm just going to sort of finish it up on some conclusions that, that came out through this study. And this has been, despite me going on and on, uh, it was a, it's, it's been a quick tour around this, uh, around this research that I did. Um, but on the first research question, price premiums protecting the forested agri-systems, um, I... I had some interesting I had some assumptions that didn't bear themselves out for sure. Um, what I found was is that most of these farms were not actually at risk of foreclosure. That's what I thought would happen because the prices had dropped down low. They weren't because during the coffee crisis, fairly early on, people stopped giving credit to small-scale farmers because they saw them as a credit risk, and so they suffered during the coffee crisis for sure. But they couldn't have their farms foreclosed on because they didn't owe anybody any money because no one would give it to them. And whereas I thought that the large farms would do well because they were well positioned to get access to credit, possibly government programs if they existed, there were no government programs as far as I know, and they were in hock up to their eyeballs, and a lot of large farms actually went out of business. So that was a huge surprise to me that it went in that direction. Um, but cooperatives were vulnerable. And in fact, there was a high period of attrition for a lot of co-ops during the period because co-ops can take on debt. Uh, small farmers couldn't, but their co-ops could. So a lot of, a lot of co-ops actually did go out of business during the period. At least that's what the co-ops were telling me. Um, and that, that was a problem for sure. And of course, that has the potential to undermine all the good work that the co-ops could do. And, the, you know, and I don't know what the environmental implications would be. Certainly the e extension programs, the agronomy programs wouldn't continue. Um, the price premiums and market pos positioning um, uh, helped the, the co-ops survive. They had more resources through it. 
made, meant that they could avoid foreclosure, they, uh, the being, uh, their debts being called in by banks, or they could actually develop innovative programs. And so the price premiums were useful more, not so much for keeping the farms in business, but certainly keeping the co-ops going and providing them the resources so that they could do all the great things that they wanted to do anyways. Uh, and the fair trade price uh, and, and market um, sufficiently incentivized organic production. So the, the environmental standards for organic were much higher. They were very strong. Um, and, uh, and what was nice about what, what I saw happening, actually very interesting conversations with farmers, was that um, the extra premium that the fair trade system provided for organic certification plus the, the preference for, um, uh, for um, fair trade buyers, so if you buy fair trade, more, like, more often than not you're buying fair trade organic at the same time, um, farmers were able to sell 100% of their organic coffee uh, as fair trade and organic, but maybe 30% of their fair trade coffee is fair, their coffee is fair trade and the rest would go in conventional market. So those two, those two market um, uh, factors actually played, uh, actually really incentivized organic certification for a lot of people. Um, as for the environmental criteria driving changes to land management, um, I actually found that uh, for the most part, um, the forest composition, there seemed to be no difference. And I couldn't find, I didn't detect in any of the interviews, anything that I saw that, you know, age of trees and this sort of thing that either certification was driving uh, planting of trees uh, or changing the nature of those trees. Uh, doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I certainly didn't see it. Um, also, the, the sort of broader changes, things about um, better environmental, uh, like things like better waste management, this sort of thing, I didn't see that happening because of fair trade environmental standards. And the reason for that was the farmers, even ones outside of the certification system, were operating at a higher level environmentally than what was required by the fair trade environmental criteria. Now, that led me to conclude that the environmental criteria for fair trade at the time wasn't really so sufficient. I've since learned that it really varies from country to country. Um, Latin America in particular, Central America in particular, I should say, in the countries there, you have more of that sort of forested ecosystem. But in other parts uh, of the world, you don't necessarily have that. Um, so the, the environmental criteria for fair trade can be more or less significant depending on the local context. Um, there were broader changes in land management were attributable to organic standards. So I saw a lot of like watershed protection and soil building efforts and waste management and these sorts of things that were specifically because they were required by um, organics. And of course, the, the absolute prohibition on agrochemicals was a huge one. Uh, in terms of the importance of cooperatives as intermediaries between farmers and certifiers, um, the, as I said before, um, you know the, the, the co-ops are responsible for designing and implementing the stand, designing the programs to implement the, pro, to the standards and ensure member compliance. Um, and that was a huge part it, it, that beyond you know you get an annual audit from a certification system that only goes so far. If you've got regular audits and, and this sort of thing from from people who are members of the co-op, that goes much further. Um, and in fact, the you couldn't have fair trade and organic coffee touching these small scale, uh, small scale farms if it wasn't for the cooperatives. And that's a huge thing. Uh, and, and in fact, to some extent, well, no, to, in a, to almost a total extent, if it wasn't for the social and political history that led to the formation of these co-ops and the work that was there, there couldn't, you couldn't have any of these things. We'd have no connection here um, through fair trade or organic coffee. You just couldn't have it. And you wouldn't have any, uh, in, um, uh, any, any influence over the way that ecosystems were managed on those farms. And then finally, in terms of the significance of the co cooperatives beyond the certification system, I mean, there were the agricultural, the agronomy programs that I'd mentioned earlier uh, that went way beyond certification criteria. You have that the cooperatives facilitated technology and skill transfers. I gave you some of the examples earlier, but that went much further. I saw, as I mentioned, I saw uh, uh, the seed sharing program. I saw a really interesting program called the Experimenters, which was basically farmers coming together, learning how to run experiments with controls and take, essentially have a lab book and figure out where are things that they can, what th are things that they can do to improve the agriculture generally, and then sharing those results with other people and sharing the outputs of them as well. And then a huge amount of cooperation among the cooperatives uh, facilitated inter co-op skill and technology transfers. And that specifically when it came to um, both the, the, the vermiculture, the lambricultura, um, and uh, even just um, farm management uh, things as well. And then that's it. And so uh, what I want to do is, so that's, that's the research bit, but there's a few things that I want to draw attention to. So I ended at, at the last point there with this idea of cooperation amongst co-ops. And one thing that I've really been promoting here when I've been speaking to co-ops and I guess co-op researchers as well is that fair trade is a really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity to really practice the sixth principle, the idea of cooperation amongst co-ops. And the reason for that is I can't think of a better tool for you to be able to identify a product that came from a cooperative. 
it's, it's required. There's no option when it comes to coffee, sugar, cocoa. Most, most of the products in fair trade will come from co-ops, not all. So you can, if you're only interested in the co-op side, you can look at which ones are and which ones aren't, but you don't have a better tool as an individual, as an institution, um, to, to actually specifically choose uh, co cooperative coffees. There's a new thing coming up with small producers, uh, actually, that, that may change that a little bit, uh, where they have their own symbol now, um, but certainly fair trade remains a, an excellent tool for that, and, and you won't find that small producer symbol in very many places. And then the other thing, and this is something that Audra mentioned earlier, is that I had a great meeting today with um, some people from the university, and there's real interest in, in making the university what we call a fair trade campus, which would shift all of its coffee that the, 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 the university and the student society purchase, uh, purchases to fair trade coffee. Um, three, a number, of, uh, quite a bit of the tea as well, and then as well, and some of the chocolate, and, and then potentially more. And a number of those products can only come from co-ops, so right away that's gonna be a big boost for co-ops, and, and, uh, and it's good for the university as well. So I encourage you to support that as much as possible. It could be a huge step for fair trade, a huge step for the university. Um, if anybody here is gonna be around in the summer, you're an academic, or you're working whatever, um, be available for them and, and see if you can uh, push them a little bit further. They're very interested in making it happen, but it sounded like one of the, one of the requirements for Fair Trade Campus is that there's a committee that really you know, pushes forward fair trade in the community, or in the, in the um, in the campus and, and it needs to have faculty representation, student representation, this sort of thing as well. So there's a real need there for, for you to be involved. Um, and should we do the thing, the video? Uh, maybe after question period. Okay, so maybe after question period, we're gonna show you this super amazing, awesome thing that, well, we might do it. Um, but it really goes into this big campaign that we're gonna do um, that's really calling for people to take a step for fair trade. And this, this thing at the university could be a huge one. Another huge one, co-op, did I mention yeah. it? Yeah, the other, another one is this idea of having a, um, a, co -op, a coffee co-op here uh, in, in this building and that also buys co-op products, co-op coffee in particular. There's various options for that. That could be another enormous step. Because it, and then, of course, you guys, whatever the product you choose is another big one as well. So we might show you that video. You know. Stay tuned. Mm. Did uh, anyone have any questions for Michael? I'm but I'll just ask one. Um, the I'm really curious about the, the proportion of when you showed us the different kinds of farms. There's the rustic, there's the commercial, there's the poly. So, what is the proportion of rustic to others? Are, are most of them reclaimed land? You know, the commercial ones. Are they land that was once farmed on one culture that they have now reclaimed because it was not productive? Or like, how, how does that happen? Um, very little of the coffee in the world is going to be produced on rustic farms. It's not a very productive system. Coffee trees, yeah, exactly. Mostly they're, they're that have been well, monoculture. not necessarily. So it may be that forest at some point has been cleared out to some extent. So Mogul and Toledo's idea was you have a forest, right? You have sort of two extremes. You have a, a forest that's been untouched, no one's ever messed around with it, and then you've got no forest at all. And so the, the gradation that happened was the extent to which you change that original forest, with the final end of that being you've cut it all down. And so with rustic, clear out a little bit of brush, plant some things, you know, the traditional polyculture, maybe you take out a few trees and put in some that you like, and, and this sort of thing for use for commercial polyculture, you more or less replaced it with other stuff, um, and then to, on towards the different monocultures. Um, and then the thing that I'd mentioned was the, the idea, the ability to actually create forests where they'd already been destroyed, and being a really good thing for that, which is, significantly different. And I mean, the, the health of an ecosystem where a commercial polyculture uh, ecosystem can be super healthy, um, especially when in, considering that, I mean, if you, I don't, I didn't put the photos up, but you can see I've, I've got this great panoramic shot between a commercial polyculture farm, that you know, one that grew up, and a fallow field right next to it. And it's just trees and all sorts of habitats, and then there's a fence, and then it's nothing, is how that goes. And, you know, and then as well, the photos where you can see that they're starting to plant new cafe tiles, like cafe, coffee farms, I mean, that's, that's huge. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, we were chatting over lunch about um, this meeting we had at the USSU and uh, the University of Saskatchewan and purchasing, food purchasing. And um, you touched upon the, the multiplier effect of this um, going through and, and how that could impact the cooperative sector. Oh, yes, thank you. That? Thank you for that. 
Um, so right, so another great thing if the, if the university actually goes ahead and, and becomes a fair trade campus, changes its purchasing to support fair trade, is it can actually have an impact on the community. So I've, I've worked on purchasing policies before, City of Vancouver, UBC, this sort of thing in, in the past, and what, what we saw there, and I've seen in other places since, um, is that when a large institution starts purchasing something, it sends a signal to the marketplace. Um, and first of all, it makes it, it makes it an issue. It makes it something that people start paying attention to and they become more aware of the concept. So that's even a in, the, in the university community itself. But other company, the companies may want to bid on the contracts that the university puts out. So they'll develop their capacity and they'll actually bring on fair trade products themselves. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe three of them will get contracts with the university, but they now have that capacity. And then what they do, is that since they've got it anyways, they just have their salespeople go out and try to promote it to other businesses and other places, and then they're essentially acting in the interests of supporting fair trade just by selling the products, right? And that it sort of follows those normal business channels. And so what we saw in, in Vancouver, and as, as an example, is that once Vancouver took that over, more fair trade started to be available in the suburbs. Shortly thereafter, you started to see it come out in you know neighboring towns and places where there weren't active fair trade advocates working and just kind of spread out in this nice way because the market developed because it was anchored on large institutions picking it up. So the university taking on a for ethical, per, um, uh, becoming a fair trade campus and changing its purchasing can have huge ramifications in the region. It can be great. It can also be a great springboard to get more uh, local sourcing of products because it's a huge part of, you know, we're very supportive of that in, when it comes to fair trade as well. I, uh, you know, I'm a co-op person, so naturally I want to ask you more about the co-ops, and I very much appreciated the tantalizing bits you did give us about the, the various ways in which co-ops create new possibilities for the sharing of knowledge and the co-production of knowledge and the implementation of more sophisticated systems and so on. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about these co-ops that were in your study, their structure, their size, their social relations involved? And, Definitely. And, and maybe you might, this wasn't your study, but you might speculate for us a bit as to what being involved with fair trade or, or organic uh, meant for the, for the co-ops as sure. well. Um, so uh, um, uh, Acopan, which was the one in Pankasan, it was the organic one, um, it was a co-op that was created on the initiative of a, an NGO, a Nicaraguan-based NGO, who had this mission to um, reforest the, the tropical humid zone that had been completely destroyed during the, um, well, the period where there was a dictator and all his friends had, and generals had huge land and cattle farms and whatnot. And they wanted to bring this forest back. And so they wanted to work with small-scale farmers um, and they wanted to, and they, they, they injected the idea of using coffee to reforest, but they, they, they realized that the livelihood and, and, and the economic security and social security of the farmers who owned the land, who worked the land, was, was crucial in order to make any kind of a, a forest grow and to, and to be a viable agro, a forest of the agro ecosystem. And so they realized that co ops were really important to that, and so they created, uh, they helped create a number of co ops out of that. But what was interesting, one thing that I was paying attention to in that was, uh, the extent to which those that NGO had this sort of pa patron type relationship with them, and what I found was that in I actually had access to more than just Acopan. There were a number of them. Um, the the NGO had no participation at all in the in the meetings of the members. There were people had different ideas about the NGO, and they only the it was the members that were pulling in the the. Um, the NGO and their agronomists and this sort of thing to present on specific issues that came up, but it was very much an autonomous group. Ecopan had about 33 members, 32 members, and a thir a thir a thir the 33rd was on the way and was attending meetings and this sort of thing as well, but coming in. And then there were, I think, between Ecopan and a number of these other co-ops, I think there was something like 3,000 families were connected to the, this, uh, these little co-op projects that had come about from, from this organization called the DAC. Um, since then, I happen to know that those co-ops now have formed into a larger co-op, or at least some of them have, um, and they've taken on more responsibility for the commercialization of the product. Um, the other one, uh, La Speranza, it, is a, it, it, has 60, it had 67 members at the time. It had just grown from the year before being 33 members, so it had it, uh, 38 members to 67, and so it had just about doubled in size. Um, it was a member of Seco Cafen, which is a, a large tertiary co-op, um, of um, 
2,500, 2,500 members or so, made up of primary co-ops like a La Esperanza. So La Esperanza was a direct member of that. And a number of secondary co-ops of other co-ops were also members. So it was kind of a mixed structure uh, for that. Um, don't know if I fully answered your question. There was one other. No, so the, there, it's a, it, was a, it wasn't, a, the, the individual farmers owned the land, um, and then they, were, they came together to um, essentially sell their product, so sell their product to the co-op and get various services from it. it was an, I, I won't digress too much, but it's an interesting history in Nicaragua in the sense of how co-ops came about in the first place through the agrarian policy of the Sandinistas once they, um, once they after the revolution in, in Nicaragua. Um, they pursued this idea of state-type agriculture. Um, that was their vision for it through the seizures of land from the former dictator. Um, and then they thought mm, farmers didn't really want to work on large state farms, so there's a lot of push for co-ops. Um, and so the, there were sort of two approaches that, that occurred. One was this large sort of the farmers, or sorry, the, the, the co-op owns the land and then the farmers work on it, and that's what the Sandinistas preferred. Um, and then the individual model. And over a period of time, and maybe 10, 15 years into the next government, there was a definite preference for the Nicaraguans, or most of them, to move towards the individual ownership and then cooperating through that point. Sometimes it was also fear. There was a lot of fear that um, the new government coming in would take the lands from the co-ops and um, give them back to the old owners, but they wouldn't do it for small farms. In fact, a number of the members of Acopan got their land that very way. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that everyone here would share this opinion, but I've been quite disappointed with the co-op center in Canada for not really getting behind the fair trade movement as much as it uh, could, and in my opinion, should. Uh, it seems to me that the co-op center is the one with the more resources, you know, lots and lots and lots of commercial operations that could be pushing fair trade and hasn't. And I would invite you, if you either agree or disagree, to speculate on why that might be and what the road is to sort of unlock them. I don't know what the reason is for. I mean, certainly there are a number of co-ops that have been important to fair trade in Canada. Um, smaller co-ops, worker co-ops, um, really, really at the forefront of, of fair trade in Canada. But in terms of a, as a sector, um, I don't know. I don't know if it's um, I don't know if it's a lack of awareness or if maybe to some extent it was an affordability issue in some cases. The question of the market. I don't know how much it's been considered. Um, I think it is growing. I think we have an excellent model in the UK uh, with the cooperative grocery stores there who have set the pace for the entire market in the sense that first ones to bring in organic, uh, fair trade bananas, first ones to have them in every store, first one to change their brand entirely co-op, uh, like their co-op brand to fair trade products. Um, now they're, they've made the commitment this year that all of their bananas will be fair trade. And, uh, before it was just some. Now all of it will be and they'll all come from co-ops only. It's a big part of their identity and it's, it's been driving the market each time. So when they first made their commitment to bananas, after that large grocery stores, stores ones that had 20, 30% control of the markets would say, they said, well, we, we're going to do this too. And then they would try to up the ante a little bit and go with even more. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a great example in the UK and it's really at the leadership of the co-ops first as sort of an initiator, um, it's really led to huge awareness of fair trade and huge consumption there. So 20% of coffee in the UK is fair trade certified. Huge amount of bananas as well. 96% recognition rate of the certification mark. Much higher than what we have here. So my hope is that actually the co-ops do uh, take this on. And I think it's good for two reasons. Uh, one, it pushes things for, for, farm, for fair trade and for farmers and it helps co-ops. That's a given. But beyond that, I think, it's a, I think it's a great opportunity for co-ops themselves. I mean, A, it's good business, right? People, there's a reason why it's, it's growing in popularity. You know, a lot of companies now, large corporations are looking at fair trade and they're actually doing it, which was never heard of before. But there's an opportunity here for a lot of co-ops to completely uh, um, in, uh, revolutionize their brand effectively. I mean, I hate to put it in such crass terms, but they could be about fair trade. This could be a part of their identity with their members, with the general public. That could be what they are as is, is this bastion of, of integrity and co-op support. And it would be kind of embarrassing, I would think, for, for a number of co-op people if a large grocery store, a Loblaws or something else would take a larger step for, for co-op uh, produced agriculture. That would be very odd uh, to me. But, but I don't know the reasons why it hasn't been looked at or if it has been looked at. Another question. 
the coffee that was grown, um, the, the shade-grown coffee and the coffee that was grown in the cold, glaring sun, are they different varieties of coffee? They can be. In that case, they weren't. They weren't. So, so coffee can grow either in sun or shade. Because there's not many plants that can thrive in those kinds of environment, harsh environments. Sure. I mean, there will be, so when I say different coffee, usually we divide it into Robusta coffee or Arabica, and most of the stuff that we drink here is Arabica. Um, and, but there are different varietals within there. So within Arabica, you might have one called Bourbon, for instance, or Katura, or whatever. There's various types, and some are able to thrive, some are more resistant to pests, some not. And so Bourbon, for instance, would never survive in a full sun environment, but some would, but they're still in the Arabica family. Yeah. I just have a piece to add to that, and then I have the, the question that I'm sure you can expect coming from me. Mm. Um, just the, the um, because of the piece of the sort of whole coffee story, the coffee that's grown, uh, that's not shade grown, and, and um, largely in Brazil and Vietnam and other sort of really large coffee producing countries, that's mechanized and that's grown as a monoculture is, is often reduced to coffee, and that's what's sold t uh, to Nescafe and kind of has a much less lesser quality, mm -hmm. and my untainted view, much worse flavor, and so forth and so on. So, so it's that anyway. Yeah. Um, but but my question is, of course, the question you can expect from me is: of the 25 farmers that you interviewed, were any of those farmers women farmers? Were these mixed co-ops, and was there any difference that you noted between, in some of your questions, between women and men farmers? Um, the the answer is yes. Uh, some are women. I had more control in Acopan than I did um, in, uh, in La Speranza. Part of the reason for that was La Speranza is really spread out, and I didn't know anybody there, and I didn't have the lay of the land. So um, you know, I, would, I would give suggestions. Here's what I'd like to see, you know, uh, but uh, you know, this is a type of person that I'd like to speak to, and you know, they would have to drive me there. Um, and, uh, and that was something where it was a little more difficult to do that. I believe I spoke to... I certainly spoke to some, some women, but I can't remember if I spoke to them as through the, um, it may have been outside the formal interviews that I was doing. I can't remember in the case of Les Brands. I think I did though, not a lot. In Acopan, there were three members who were women, actually two, and then the person coming in was a woman as well. And um, I, all of them were included in the study. Uh, one of them was now the president of the co-op. Um, another one was uh, the vocal, you know, the, you're familiar with the, okay, so vocal is kind of like a, it's like a stand, it's an important, you have a board of directors, there's sort of like these standard sort of positions, president, vice president, treasurer, and the vocal kind of stands in if someone else can't do their thing, but they're still a full voting member of the board. Um, and then the uh, person coming in was interesting in the sense that um, huge respect, and she was very young too, and wasn't even a full member yet, and it was very interesting to watch the dynamics when I was in the co-op meetings. So these were things that I was paying attention to in terms of how are people being listened to, and you know, what was the influence that in individual members had. And I was very surprised by this. Um, in fact, what was interesting as well when it came to things like, uh, speaking of gender, uh, I got the most um, interesting information from the former president who stepped down because he'd heard that it would be important for, if they, were, they weren't fair trade certified but they were considering it, he heard that it would be important, or they heard, the, the board generally or the, the co-op had heard that it could be important because none of the, none of the female, neither of the two female members were uh, on the board of directors. And so and he'd, been the direct, he'd been the president for a good number of years, so he said, well, I'll just step down. And then they voted in this one woman who was amazing, actually. She's, I don't know if she's, been, to, she's been to Canada now. Um, very, a very interesting woman, and she came in hugely respected person, she took control, and then not, not only did he sort of say, I'm gonna step down, and he's hugely respected in the community as well, he was also pointing out to things like, the co-op doesn't nearly uh, value, or doesn't, there's not a clear recognition of the what work that the wives did, um, whether they were members of the co-op or not. He was saying that this is this, th they, it's not, um, th essentially that the farms wouldn't function without them, and there has to be a way to be able to recognize that, and he was the one that was really driving this gender agenda, which was really interesting. Um, the, the women that I spoke to, yeah, they were, they were different. You know, the, pre the current president, she was quite savvy and she was really interested in how this could be developed. And the new member coming in was also a member of a local, the local women's association um, and really driving that as well. But the other person who was on the board just wasn't a factor for her. Was there any difference between the, the sort of way that environment or way that some of your questions around the ecosystem questions and the, you know, the 
their reasons for farming the way that they did and stuff? Was, was there any kind of, did you know, were there enough women, I guess, to even notice that there was a difference? or Because yeah. it's, it it's something that's discussed in the literature, you know, a different approach to farming, a different understanding of environment and so right. forth that tends to come out between women and men farmers. So I don't know if there's... I didn't come across it. I mean, it was a very small sample size to be able to pick that up. Um, also, you know, I mean, I, I, if I was to guess, I would say that m m many of the people, certainly in Akapan, learned how to farm coffee from ADAC, which is the, the NGO that I mentioned. Before that, once they got their land, there, were, there was one farmer I know who ended up receiving like 15 hectares from land reform, huge amount of land, um, or for, for the, the area anyways. And um, when, when ADAC came, he was farming like two hectares of that or not even on beans and corn and then the rest was just fallow and he didn't he wasn't using it because before that he'd been um, a worker on a plantation and like a really ex like very exploited worker really he didn't really know what was attached to that not all the members had come off of plantations in that way but many of them learned how to farm through the same source so that was really going to be their main source of learning how to farm in the other cases it was mostly from um, uh, from the co-ops themselves in fact, there was a really interesting strategy that um, when I went into uh, La Speranza that they did. Um, so the, 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 um, I mentioned that the, that one NGO created these different co-ops and stuff like that. Um, and then there was Seco Cafen, which was the large tertiary co-op. And it was largely understood that Seco Cafen was much better at commercializing products and, and selling them and getting good prices for it. And a DAC had really good uh, environmental standards, but you couldn't be members of both co-ops. So what would happen there is the, f the husband or the wife would be the member of one co-op and the husband and wife would be of the other one or a, a son or a daughter or something like that and they would essentially avail themselves of the services of both co-ops and there was a lot of, uh, that may have also been a mechanism for technology transfer between as well. So, you know, you had in one case, I was on the farm and I was actually staying with the president of the, uh, of La Speranza and, you know, he's really proud of Seco Capen, this sort of thing and his son was a member of the other one and they were just putting in a bee culture, like beehive kind of thing, whatever. That's how I got stung one time, by the way. Uh, don't do killer bees, man, I'm telling you. Um, but they were doing that, and it was a really interesting process. So I, I think that that was more where they were getting their, their knowledge of farming.